Welcome to your first recorded lecture. This is to start our unit on variables in measurement. Most of the material can be found in chapter 3 in your textbook with a little bit of material definitions drawn from chapter 1. This is going to be a two-part lecture that's broken down for ease of streaming. The first part is going to cover variables and data types. The second part will cover reliability and validity concepts that are covered also in chapter 3. So now for the first part, variables and data types. The important thing to realize when we're discussing any sort of behavior in psychology and when we're conducting any sort of research study is that we need to be very precise and formalize the concepts about which we're talking. That is, it's very easy to come up with different hypotheses or different theories or different hunches about behavior and what different things may impact that behavior. So we might have a uh, um, study that we want to look at intelligence and we might have a hunch about how different gender for example might score on an intelligence test or a test about anxiety or exhibit any sort of behavior like altruism but in order to actually study these behaviors using the scientific method that we've talked about what we have to do is be very precise in terms of how we're going to formalize these concepts concepts now specifically the first thing that we're going to use is psychological constructs. Okay? Construct is just the word that we use for any abstract concept that can't be directly measured but has to be inferred from behavior. So whereas some physical qualities are directly measurable such as height or weight or different physiological properties like heart rate for example, constructs are abstract and so these things that we have to develop a way to measure them without being able to directly observe or directly measure them. So things such as anxiety, or love, or intelligence, a lot of these very common constructs that we're using in psychology are things that we might have an intuitive sense about what they mean, but what we have to do is figure out exactly how we're going to measure these things. Exactly how do you measure something like love, or intelligence, or inhibition, or a social interaction? Well, in order to identify these constructs and define them, we typically distinguish between two different types of definitions. The first is a theoretical definition. This is in terms of what you would think you would find in a textbook or even a dictionary. When you're speaking about something day to day, you're talking about the theoretical definition. For something like intelligence, might be um, a general affinity or propensity for solving problems or excelling in novel situations, for example. Okay, anxiety might be um, a general state of stress or apprehension or tension towards something. Okay, and this is the definition in terms of the quality of the behavior about what you're talking. Now, most importantly in a research design course is what we have to do is when we want to talk about these psychological constructs, we have to move beyond theoretical definitions and develop something very important that are referred to as operational definitions. This is also defined by Jackson in Chapter 3. An operational definition takes the theoretical definition for a construct and redefines it in terms of exactly how you're going to measure it in the context of your research design. Now what do we mean by that? Again, let's stick with an example of something like intelligence. Okay, we all might have a sense of what intelligence is, but how we're going to operationally define intelligence is a different story. Typically, we refer to scores on something like an IQ test as a score of intelligence or if we're talking about a different type of intelligence like musical intelligence or musical ability then maybe it, it's the way that you perform a certain piece of music that can then be scored. Okay, So the operational definition again what it does is it defines in terms of exactly what are you going to measure and how are you going to say that somebody has more of something such as intelligence than somebody else. If you want to know does an increased uh, amount of social interaction or do larger social circles provide sort of a, a buffer for potential blows to your self-esteem? Well, that might sound like a very valid sort of lay theory or concept, but the thing is we've introduced there two key constructs, social circle and self-esteem. So we need to figure out ways that we're going to exactly measure those two things in people. Those aren't things we can directly observe. So we might ask people how many friends they have, how many Facebook friends they have, how many people do they interact with on a daily basis. 
And what we might do is convert those numbers into an operational definition for a size of a social network or social circle. And then similarly, when we look at something like self-esteem, exactly how are we going to measure somebody's self-esteem? We need to think about what high versus low self-esteem mean to us, theoretically, and then create operational definitions for those measures. Okay, if we think somebody with high self-esteem should exhibit certain traits, maybe what we present is people a list of 10 or 12 different traits, ask them to rate themselves on a scale of 1 to 10, how much that trait they exhibit, and then what we can do is to add up those values and call higher scores on this new self-esteem scale that we've created, our operational definition for self-esteem. So again, what an operational definition does is it redefines the construct in which we're interested precisely in terms of how we're measuring it in our specific research design or research study. Well, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about the different variable types. That is, what exactly are these different things that we're going to be measuring? Okay, so if we measure something on a scale of 1 to 10 versus measuring it by taking a heart rate versus measuring it by counting the number of friends somebody has on Facebook, these are all different variables that might serve different purposes. Now, the reason for cataloging these here isn't just to memorize a bunch of different terms. It's important that you guys understand at this point these foundational concepts because we're going to be using these terms over the entire course of the semester. Independent variable, dependent variable, continuous variable. Uh, it's measured on an interval scale or a ratio scale. And when we talk about these things, it's going to be important that you guys don't have to sit there and think for a minute, well, what's he talking about again? What's a dependent variable again? By understanding clearly early on exactly what these different terms represent, it's going to be a lot easier for you guys to digest the material that's going to come down the pike later in the course. Furthermore, it also is going to be important for some of the decisions that we're going to make in terms of which type of research design we might use in a specific situation, as well as what types of statistics we might calculate on the data that we collect. Because some of these decisions are going to be based on the types of variables we have, the numbers of different types of variables that we have, and exactly on what measurement scale these variables are represented. The first distinction that we make is between what we call independent variables, or IVs, and dependent variables, or DVs. Now, the formal definitions are given here, and slightly different but, but consistent definitions are given by Jackson in your textbook. The key thing to keep in mind is that independent variables are the ones that we expect to have an influence on some other behavior. Temporally, you might typically think of these things as coming first. We want to know what is the influence of age on something else, or the influence of gender on something else. Do people get wiser as they get older? We want to know, does age have an effect on intelligence? Are women smarter than men? We want to know, does gender have an effect on intelligence? Well, in these examples, age and gender are the independent variables. And intelligence would be the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the outcome or the behavior that we want to know about. And typically what we're interested in is what are the different factors that might affect, that is, increase or decrease or co-vary with the dependent variable of interest. Finally, there's a third type of variable that we need to keep in mind what are called extraneous variables, sometimes control variables, and sometimes these can also be referred to specifically as confounding variables. Now we're not going to talk an awful lot about these, but it's important to understand that these exist. So you might have a theory about something like a relationship between age and intelligence. But there might be a lot of other variables that are coming into play, either that you're not measuring or in which you're not interested, but they might nevertheless have an influence on the dependent variable. As you can imagine, there's a lot of things that influence somebody's intelligence. And a lot of these things might happen to vary with age, or maybe not. But it's important to then understand that if we want to know, for example, whether or not people who are older are also more intelligent, we might have to understand that there are other variables that are going to be coming into play, such as income, education, socioeconomic status, that might also vary along with age that 
could really be exerting the influence that we're ultimately attributing to age. These are going to be extraneous variables, meaning they lie outside our realm of interest or our realm of investigation. And oftentimes, as we'll see later on, what we often do is to record these variables as well. So we might, not, we might ask somebody their age as well as the degree of education they've achieved, their socioeconomic status, and so forth and so on. And then we can at least understand whether or not the relationship between age and intelligence still exists when we control for or get rid of the effect of the extraneous variables. So let's look at some other ways that we can classify variables. Independent and dependent variables is classing, classifying variables according to the role that they play in a research design. Another very important distinction is to classify variables based on the type of measurement that we're making. Well, what do I mean by that? There's two different types of variables in this case. Again, these are covered by Jackson in Chapter 3. The first is a discrete variable that can only take on a finite and typically small number of possible values. That is, if something is measured on a discrete scale or a discrete data type, what that means is that the, the data exist only in specific steps along a scale. This is in contrast to continuous variables that, as the name suggests, exist along an entire continuum. In other words, these can theoretically take on any number of, any infinite number of values. And well, this might be a concept that's kind of hard to grasp without some examples, so we'll see those in just a second. But think about a lot of common physical measurements, such as weight and height and some of these things. These are all continuous variables because somebody's height doesn't just jump from 6 foot 1 inch to 6 foot 2 inches to 6 foot 3 inches. That might be the way that we talk about it. But in reality, you can measure somebody's height down to the millimeter or even finer detail. It's all just a matter of the precision of the ruler that you're using to measure the person. So in this case, height actually exists on a continuous scale. Between 2 millimeters and 3 millimeters, there's always a fraction that you can look at. You can always find a value between those two. Now, on a discrete scale, that's not going to be the case. A discrete variable, there's only a specific number of values that something might take on. Let's say they're voting in Congress uh, or in the Senate on some sort of policy measure. Okay, well, we know there's going to be 100 senators. There's going to be 100 votes. If we want to think about the number of yes votes for this policy measure, it's only going to be 45 or 46. There's no way you can have 45.2 yes votes or 45.21693 yes votes for this policy. That is, yes votes in the Senate, or number of no votes if you prefer, is a discrete variable. There's only specific values that it can take on, in this case the whole numbers ranging from 0 to 100. Values in between those don't make any sense. Now again, hopefully that highlights the difference between discrete and continuous variables, but it always helps to have some examples of some of these things. So what I'm going to do is outline a research study, and the first thing I want you guys to do is to identify the different variables that are going to exist, and then we're going to think about classifying the different variables as well.